morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us for the Hourglass webinar this morning. Uh, today's subject matter is the risks older people face with abuse, poverty and the cost of living crisis. Subject matter I know which is dear to many people on the webinar today, with the cost of living crisis having real concerning implications on the economic and physical well-being of older people across the UK. Uh, as you can see, we have four panel members joining us today. Um, if I could ask uh, everybody to introduce themselves one by one. Danny, can we start with you? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Danny Tatlow, the Research and uh, Policy Officer at Hourglass. And this webinar <laughs> is linked to um, a couple of policy investigations and policy briefs that we at Hourglass have been participating in. One focused primarily on the ongoing cost of living crisis and how it affects um, older people and the other focused on the links between uh, poverty and abuse and violence committed uh, towards and against older people. Thanks. Thanks Danny. Morgan. Hello everyone uh, my name is Morgan Vine. I work for the National Older People's Charity Independent Age um, and we specifically focus our activity on older people facing financial hardship. We have um, free information and advice uh, we give grants to local community organisations and then I lead the policy and influencing function, which is looking at the experiences of older people facing financial hardship and what policy solutions could help them. So how we affect government and things like that. Great. Thanks, Morgan. Gary. Good morning, folks. My name is Gary McGorn from the Department for Communities in Northern Ireland. I'm the head of branch of Meet the Call Wraparound. Um, it's a service um, in Northern Ireland, what's being run to try and ensure uh, all individuals and households are receiving all the benefits, supports and services to which they and their families are entitled. Um, offers people-centered interventions to help customers access services and benefits within the department and also the wider uh, voluntary and commu community sector as well. Um, and to put people at the heart of the service we offer, trying to look at the customer as a whole, where we're um, situated within the, the benefit department. Um, we try and liaise with um, partners across government and Department of Health, Department of Justice and Education as well. Thanks, Gary. Uh, Veronica. Morning, everybody. I am Veronica Mann and I work with a company called Talis. We're independent financial advisors. We're based in Kent, but we cover the whole of the south of England and with Zoom and telephones, we cover anywhere that you need to be covered. We concentrate on helping people individually to manage their money and to make the best use of it, and in particular help them structure funds so that they've never run out. Uh, we're really pleased to be working with Hourglass because this is such an important area to support where people don't know what they can and can't do, or where they're being pressurized to do things that perhaps is not in their best interests. Great, thank you very much. Uh, my name is, is Richard Robinson. I'm the Chief Executive of Our Class. We are the, uh, the Safe Raging Charity uh, for England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland focused on ending the abuse of older people. Uh, we also work to end financial abuse and neglect. Uh, we have a 24-7 helpline, uh, casework teams, and we have a series of IDFAs or Independent Domestic Violence Advocates generally around the south of England. Uh, you'll also see another box uh, which uh, has our logo on it, and that is Naeem, who is helping us behind the scenes. If you have any questions for us, uh, please type them into the chat, uh, and we will add them as we go along. So I'll start the ball rolling. Um, Danny, the cost of living crisis, what, what in very general terms are the effects that, that that's having on older people? Um, thanks, Richard. I think you can really quantify the effects in, in four main ways uh, concerning the cost of living crisis. Um, sort of health effects, well-being of life effects, uh, quality of life effects, and the risk of violence and abuse effects. Um, sort of health effects really related to um, struggle, though sort of coming into warmer weather, this is less of a factor, but as we've seen through the winter period, um, if older people, as, as many people across the UK, have been struggling with rising energy prices, um, the fact sort of choosing whether to heat their homes or sort of not, 
Um, I mean, really, the choice of choosing to sacrifice health because you can't afford heating, um, well-being in sort of barely managed to get by with food prices, rising food prices, quality of life, not being able to afford transport or or means to to go out and enjoy enjoy yourself to meet friends. And as we'll talk about later on, sort of the rising risk of violence and abuse linked to um, linked to poverty and sort of socio-economic crisis, like the cost of living crisis. Um, for older people in particular, who may be more at risk of health, um, of isolation factors than um, younger people, the cost of living crisis sort of has real concerning implications on the older generation through these four things, health, well-being, quality of life, and risk of violence and abuse. Um, and it's really sort of, we're seeing poverty among pensioners the highest it's been since the 2008 recession. It really is, as I just said, concerning for these four main things um, as a go, and then sort of seeing linkages between other broader areas, which I'm sure we'll talk about later on. But yeah, the, the four main, effects really are, are being seen in health, well-being, quality of life, and the risk of violence and abuse, thanks to the cost of living crisis. Okay. Morgan, just, is that borne out by what you're hearing from an independent age perspective? Yeah, so Independent Age has a national helpline and we also have advisors who take calls every day, and I definitely echo what Danny said. Um, some additional things that we've been hearing and seeing, I mean, just to put this into context for people, so we spoke to an older person in financial hardship recently who said they were setting the alarm for two in the morning so that they could get up, boil the kettle because they were on a tariff that made it cheaper in the middle of the night. They boiled the kettle, filled a thermos flask at two in the morning and then got back up in the morning to have hot water. We've spoken to people who are skipping meals, reducing the amount of food that they're eating. And obviously we all know that that's having a massive impact on physical and mental health conditions. Um, Many of you will know this, but the prevalence of disability massively increases as people get older. So 42%, nearly half of people over state pension age report that they have a disability. And if they're living in a cold home or they're not eating well, that's obviously going to have a huge impact on both their physical health and their mental health. And um, also just to touch on one of Danny's points, we're definitely hearing that people assumed they might be more financially secure as the year went on because the warmer months have come in. But we're actually hearing that people don't feel like that. Um, with the energy bill support scheme ending, people are now seeing the extra cost of their bills in sort of full light, as it were. Um, so they're incredibly worried and incredibly anxious, and they're calling us to try and get help, having often never called any charity before to it be in this situation that's what they're telling us they've never been in a situation where they've needed or had to do this um so yeah we want to make sure that you know everyone in later life who's facing financial hardship is getting what they're entitled to and able to live life on the best terms that they can and that they've got all of the money that they need um so yeah that's that that we definitely echo what danny said and is borne out by our helpline in terms of getting what people are entitled to gary are you uh are you hearing the same things? Are the same pressures from an NI perspective as well? Uh, very much so, Richard. Um, our service is available to, to people of, of working age and above, but um, people of pension age have always been one of our, our key, uh, key target areas. Um, I think in the last 22, 23, there was a 27% increase in calls to our helpline. Um, that's about 65,000 calls within the year. Um, and really, Cost of living has been the, the main driving factor in that. Um, we're also picking up anecdotally from uh, our guys at Sighting People's Houses, or guys already worked with um, uh, uh, older people before. The, maybe where they've talked to them a few years ago and they have been going through benefit entitlements. We're always trying to promote pension credit. And a few times people have been saying, no, I'm okay. Maybe not now. I'll see. People are starting to come back to us now and say, look, I talked to you before. I think um, I'd like to go ahead now. Can you help me? Or do you think I'd still be entitled? Um, and again, as Morgan says, well, one of our our big factors is, um, you know, not just pension credit, but really making sure people that um, of older age who are experiencing disabilities or health issues are also looking to other benefits that they're entitled to, like attendance allowance. 
And again, the anecdotal stuff comes back from outreach officers. You know, I'm okay, sure, I can get about the house. I'm okay, the, the nephew, niece, granddaughter calls in. You know, things that they're trying to say, I get by on now. We're trying to make sure that they're saying, no, you need to fully optimize your income because this is impacting uh, on your whole lifestyle. Um, and again, the, the cost of living payments, um, the one-off payments that have been been helpful um, over the last year, um, you know, the, the run in this year, but they're very quickly gone. You know, and we get a lot of calls about that. Um, are people entitled? And then once it goes, what else can they use? So, yeah, the the, the concern out there is, is very palpable. Yeah. Thanks, Gary. Uh, Veronica, uh, Gary mentioned the words uh, making the best of the income you had. How is that affecting the decisions that people are making financially uh, when they're talking to you at the moment? Um, well, it, it depends because most people who talk to us have money. Mm. It's, they are not stressed in the way that people are who call Hourglass or Citizens Advice. But people are still being pressurized by their families to gift now when it's not necessarily affordable because my concern with any of my clients is to make sure that my client never runs out of money but that has to be countered with the yes but my daughter needs some help cause and it's a it's a balancing act i mean one of the things that uh, upsets me you mentioned attendance allowance a lot of clients in our books are entitled to attendance allowance but they either don't want to claim it because they feel they shouldn't or well, they don't know they can claim it. And it's a benefit that's there for everyone. So if you can, you should. And it can make an enormous amount of difference. 400 plus pounds a month is not to be sneezed at. So for the our clients, it's more a question of where do they spend their money. For the people who call in, because I'm a member of SOLA, which means I'm accredited in which people phone me for advice on care fees, if they've run out of money, they've run out of money. It's not knowing that if they'd called me three years ago, we might have been able to help. That is what is really upsetting. Yes, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, you wanted to pick up on the attitude point Gary made, uh, Morgan. Yes, thanks. Um, I was just going to say, I really support what Gary was saying. So at Independent Age, we often hear people who are below the poverty line, technically below the poverty line, telling us things like um, there must be people worse off than me I don't want to take the money away if somebody else is struggling more and these are people who you know one woman who literally said that word to word for me at an event also in the same breath told me that she goes to bed wearing the woolly hat to keep warm she turns mm. the lights off at 6 p.m so that she's not using electricity um, we also did some research last year where we were specifically talking to older people whose income was below the poverty line and we asked them a question about whether they felt they had enough money to live on. And lots of them said yes. So obviously we asked a bit more and tried to interrogate that because they were technically below the poverty line. So that didn't align for us. And a lot of their responses were, well, you know, I have this amount per month. And if I skip meals twice a week and I don't use my washing machine for a month and I do this, 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 by the end of the month, I've still got 50 pounds left. So I have got enough money. And that was how they perceived it. So we have to get around like how just asking somebody we have to use observation we have to use our own skills as organizations and charities and professionals to try and work out if people do need support and as veronica said then push them to what they're entitled to which they might not be receiving from an hourglass perspective do, do we do you have any um idea danny about how um the cost of living crisis affected hourglass calls is this is this data you have Unfortunately, Richard, it's very hard sometimes to um, glean that with our information officers talking to victims and victim survivors um, when they call in that hourglass because a lot of people don't like to see themselves um, as being affected um, by the cost of living crisis. Um, as Morgan just said, it's sort of there are people off worse than myself. So sometimes it'd be very hard to sort of see the links um, from a data standpoint. Um, as to the cost of living crisis, as we've seen in our glass. There are obviously self-neglect um, cases out there, but again, it's it's very hard to, to get people to sometimes see the links or tell us about the links when they when they phone in. 
um, and economic abuse, financial abuse cases, which may um, link to uh, the cost of living crisis and sort of the fear um, when sort of family members are also uh, running out of money or worried about their uh, finances and may seek to uh, cajole or steal from an older relative. Again, um, because of the sort of the immediacy uh, of the case as it appears to the victim, victim survivor, the sort of background factors that may include the cost of living crisis are harder to see really, unfortunately. So that, that makes it a struggle from a data perspective, unfortunately. Okay. Um, what support from a uh, from an older person's perspective? What sh what sort of support could be out there? What what would you know from a solutions management perspective? What could the governments across the the, the four nations, or from a Westminster perspective, what what could they look at to try to 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 help with this cost of living crisis from an older person's perspective? Does anyone want to pick up on that, Morgan? Yeah, I'm happy to start. Um, so at Independent Age, we've done a lot of work around pension credit. Um, so for those on the call who have never heard of this, it's a means tested benefit for older people on low income. So if older people get lower than the full state pension, they may well qualify for pension credit unless they've got masses of savings somewhere. Um, so pension credit is very, very under received by the people who need it. Um, the most recent data that was released was for 2019, 2020, which is obviously completely out of date, which is another problem. Um, but even then it showed that 850,000 older households don't get the pension credit they're entitled to. Um, and that's about 1.7 billion pounds a year unreceived by those groups. Um, the people that we talk to who do get pension credit tell us, you know, they're then able to buy fresh fruit, they're then, then able to put their heating on, their electricity, they are able to have showers and baths, you know, so that it can make a huge difference. I'm not saying it's a silver bullet, but it can definitely make a huge difference. The other really important thing about pension credit is even if somebody only qualified for one pound a week more, you might think, oh, there's no point. But once you qualify for pension credit, you open up eligibility to lots of other things. And our research shows it's about £8,000 a year more so for example housing benefit council tax can go down to nothing um free prescriptions free dental free glasses there's a big long list of the additional benefits that if you get pension credit you would then qualify for so it's really really important from our side that the government do more to actively promote explore if there's any ways to automate this if they can target promotion at areas of deprivation there has been progress in the last year the government invested three million pounds in awareness campaigns um, but from our perspective they were very broad and broad brush we know where older people in deprivation live we we, we know how to target them even if you just looked at geographical areas um, but obviously you could also look at things like we know single women are at more risk of living in poverty in later life we know people from black and asian communities are at more risk so there are ways that promotion could be better targeted in, and and then on top of that including more innovative solutions like partial auto enrollment or linking data where if you receive housing benefit you're probably going to be entitled to pension credit if you're an older person so could we link them so there's lots of things we think the government could explore to get that money to people and just to touch on veronica's point earlier attendance allowance as well um so many people have no idea it exists don't know what it is but if you can get it it can make a massive difference financially thank you gary is, uh, is this something you echo yeah, um, we work closely with um, the Pension Service in Northern Ireland and uh, other stakeholders such as EHNI um, and uh, um, any any other organisation that's, that's dealing directly with older people. Um, one of the sort of innovative things we're trying to look at, Morgan, um, my guys are out doing a, a session in the Health Trust at the minute for CURS in the community. And we're giving them uh, leaflets, we're giving them contact points, because these are the people that are actually in houses talking to people, probably seeing the people in most need. Um, and that's the way we're trying to sort of advertising, social media, it's all very good. But if it's not landing, you know, how do you know who he doesn't get? Um, so we do try and link them with organisations. We have uh, outreach officers who are out in the community, so they know their local uh, organisations. They know the local partnerships 
um, what we do uh, a lot of events, confirmation sessions, in entitlement clinics. We can set up in the library for a day, get it well promoted. Um, and if somebody wants to come in the library, they can sit and talk with one of our uh, outreach advisors who can go through their circumstances and, and see if they are entitled. I think one of the important things around uh, pension credit, I totally echo everything Morgan said, the benefits, the passport of benefits especially, um, is there's nothing to lose in a plan for it either. You know, um, you apply, you know, see what, what happens. There are a few restrictions around capital, but it's very dependent on individual circumstances. There's no one broad brush in capital because it can depend on, again, um, disabilities and disability premiums, things like that. So we're really trying to um, be as innovative as possible to try and reach out to people. Um, we do still, uh, as part of a, the department way, we do use a lot of social media because, again, it's getting to maybe people's cars, people's relatives, who can, you know, sort of suggest to, to the other person, this is something you should be looking at. Um, but again, coming back, it's a bit of breaking down the stigma. You know, it's a benefit. People don't see a pension as a as a, a benefit as something, it's an entitlement. Whereas your plan for pension credits a benefit, and a lot of people can be very proud or I've never had been on benefits and working on it. I'm not going to start now. So again, it's trying to break down that stigma and help people understand, you know, this is something you are entitled to. The money's there to be claimed. You know, you're not doing anybody else out of it. This is the other one, you know, give it to somebody who might need it more. You know, it doesn't work. I was just going to say that so many people are too proud to take or to ask, especially the older generation, um, 80 plus. They've come through a really difficult life and now they don't want to ask for help and I have had some quite difficult conversations with clients saying ask oh it's too complicated I don't need it but uh, absolutely Gary we really need to remove that stigma because people shouldn't be living in poverty when there's help out there we uh, um, sorry carry on Gary or as Morgan said as well, making it as easy as possible to claim. You know, um, people can be put off by forms. You can claim pension credit online now, but again, is that always the right way? Um, and we will try and get our outreach officers out in the people's house and help them, you know, make the claim. You know, they're used to this. They know the questions. They know why they're being asked. Anybody sees a claim form, you know, it's like a booklet, but yet half it might be relevant to you. So they're able to help the person navigate through it uh, and submit it. And again, then follow up, you know, once that happens, you know, the pension credit is awarded, right? Let's look at where we're going next. What else could that lead into? In terms of conduits, um, I don't know if people are aware that the government um, announced a whole suite of funding for domestic abuse, which is clearly something we as a charity are very focused on, which led to the um, the rollout of a number of IDFAs across the whole of England and Wales. I know there's a similar scheme in Northern Ireland as well, um, with a, a slightly different scheme in Scotland as well. Um, but it seems to me to be slightly odd that, that um, the conduit, that the people, the government and, and other agencies aren't using IDFAs as a conduit for this type of information to get out there. And what I'm hearing is if innovation is the way forward, um, then maybe those that are dealing with the uh, older people who are directly at risk should be having this type of information at their fingertips. Um, we as a charity found it very odd that uh, the MOJ, the Ministry of, of Justice in Westminster, were very keen to support IDFAs um, uh, across the whole of England and Wales, but, but put, a, a, um, uh, put a lot of priority on, on IDFAs for younger, for children but not the same priority for older people. And I think if we're trying to use different conduits to get that information out there, perhaps having um, IDFAs and ISFAs across England and Wales, particularly in this case, um, who would have that type of financial information, because clearly financial abuse is so rife at the moment, um, you know, we would have all of that information at their fingertips as well. Um, okay, so um, from a, a more general perspective, um, th there is a phrase I wasn't aware of until I read this brief. Danny, you'll have to help me out here. Um, structural violence. It, can poverty be considered a form of structural violence? Um, and, and, and what's the 
what's the remedy there? Um, <clears throat> well, arguably, yes. Uh, a number of academics and other stakeholders do consider poverty as structural violence. And, and in this case, we're, we're defining structural violence really as differentiated from personal or interpersonal violence, also could be called direct or indirect violence. Um, but there's no actor committing the violence, but it, it, it emerges from the, the unequal distribution of power, of resources, or other means. Um, and if we consider poverty as, we consider sort of really Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, sorry if I'm getting too sort of sociological here, where sort of physiological and safety needs um, that sort of make all humans able to participate in society. Poverty can take away access to food, access to water, um, access to, to shelter um, in a, sorry, a physiological sense uh, and in a safety sense, sort of access to employment, um, health, um, and also in a esteem as also a, a part of the hierarchy of needs. And, and poverty really um, affects respect, self-esteem, um, status of oneself, so if we if we see poverty as um, as as existing for older people as part of a broader a broader sense of the fact that um, looking at older people in poverty they may not have access to um, same means as richer pensioners poor pensioners we we see sort of poverty as um, how it affects participation in everyday life. Through the restrictions of what makes us human really that that is the the inequality and the socio-economic issues that create the intersectional barriers from a systemic standpoint rather than from an interpersonal slash direct violent standpoint so uh, from a uh, from a human rights perspective this uh, this 3.1% increase um, uh, around state pension, pension credit, and financial entitlements, uh, which uh, which I, which was increased in April 2022, is that in effect? Not going into too much academia here, is that in effect uh, a bit like a form of attack on an erosion on human rights from an older person's perspective? I mean, I, I probably wouldn't be the right person. Uh... I don't come from a human rights background um, to argue that, but I think sort of the, I mean, an interesting thing would be to look at the the pension, the triple lock. Um, obviously we've seen um, it's, it's the balance really between um, needing the pension triple lock in order for older people to um, have uh, a means of um, enjoying themselves as humans and safer aging. But you've also got to balance that between sort of the intergenerational um, effects that, that the pension triple triple lock is. It's really, we can see poverty as, and the means to affect poverty really is as being a rising tide raises all boats. Um, rather than sort of uh, moving means and resources to specific groups um there should be uh a a concentrated effort from government to um focus and we're looking at an older person's perspective here all older people um rather than sort of specific groups um, and specific areas really but i i unfortunately sort of the structural um yeah. aspects of poverty is probably too wide for us to discuss here as, as a means to um, sort of solve it. But I think um, a real starter is actual concentrated effort from governments um, to identify that, that this is a problem and, and needs, needs a solution. Okay, just looking at the chat for a second. So uh, there's a question here by Anthony Jackson. As a practicing social worker and mental health, many service users are reducing or canceling recommended care due to the increased care costs. This is extremely worrying. I wonder if there's any data on this trend, which is underpinned by the cost of living crisis. Uh, does anyone particularly want to come in on that? Uh, I, I think it's a good point in its own right. Uh, thanks, Anthony, that's really useful. Uh, Marion Barton, our members listening to the webinar about the social prescriber link, 
workers at surgeries who can help people to get the support they need. If not, please advise that each primary care network, uh, their local doctor surgeries may well have a worker who can provide the support for patients' well-being. I think that's a really interesting point. Thank you very much, Marion. And, and also Tina Walker, um, she says that um, uh, an older person with an IDFA says she couldn't help with benefit support, not even a letter of support. And I think that's a really interesting point um, around uh, how we ensure that all people working with, with older people directly at risk have the means to get involved in these particular uh, sort of cases and understanding. Um, okay. Now, um, I'm, I'm going to move on to violence and abuse um, uh, and, and whether there is um, whether poverty leads to an increased risk here. Um, now, it doesn't necessarily need to be based around uh, domestic abuse or whatever, but we can look at what risk factors are there for older people during this cost of living crisis. Uh, Morgan, do you want to pick up on that initially? Yeah, I was just going to touch on um, a point that Danny made, actually. One of the things that's come out of the research we've been doing recently is the big things you'd expect, like energy, is definitely a problem. But there's also lots and lots of smaller costs that once they add up are really, really squeezing people. So I thought what Danny said was really interesting about disconnecting from different things. So, for example, disconnecting from broadbands come up that a lot of older people are thinking about disconnecting and removing their broadband connections because they can't afford the tech or the connection and obviously bearing in mind financial abuse and other things that's cutting them off from the world outside it's cutting them off from knowing what they might be entitled to it's cutting them off from connections from family so I definitely think there are some risks not I mean independent age unlike hourglass we don't specialize in in financial abuse but I thought that might be useful to say and the other thing is the triple lock's an interesting thing because actually 20 percent of older people only have their state pension and benefits that's it so for that reason the triple lock is important to that group and because the government doesn't yet identify well enough older people on low income and we know that because the pension credit uptake rate is so poor um, it's something like between 60 and 70 percent so 30 percent minimum of older people on low income entitled to that money do not receive it because of that we're supportive of the broader intervention. So one of the cost of living payments was just for pensioners. And it got a bit of criticism because obviously there are some pensioners who are wealthy and rich, but we were supportive of it because the government does not know who the older people missing out are. And if it doesn't give them the money, they're gonna be more at risk of lots of the things that I know Hourglass specialise in. Okay. Um, other risks, um, Gary, uh, are you hearing much around things like fuel and food poverty? Yeah, very much so, Richard. I don't think it's, it's the point is, yeah, it's probably more inflationary now than just fuel poverty. You know, it's food prices, it's, you know, uh, bills, everything is on the up. And that's where you're seeing the the, the, the increase in uh, in contact with our, with our helpline. Um, I think, again, what we try to do and try and help as much as possible, same services beyond um, benefits as well. So with respect to fuel poverty, we have good links in with some of the affordable warmth schemes within the local authorities here, um, the boiler replacement schemes, things like that, which um, people might not know about, but could again be entitled to. Um, not direct benefit, but we can make a, a referral, get somebody out to, to assess the house or whatever else. Um, and again, it probably comes back to the important point and one of our real things we promote is we are on people's houses um, helping them. And the guys will tell me, I'd read people come back in, you know, went out to do a straightforward uh, benefit form, but sitting in the house, you could feel the damp, you know, and you, you start asking the questions then, you know, have you a problem with heating? Is there a problem with, you know, the ventilation? Have you... And then, then things come out. But people aren't going to lift the phone all the time and say that, you know, my house is damp, my house is cold, my boiler is on its last legs. So the, the outreach officers being in the house can start, you know, probing them questions as well and trying to get all the agencies involved that can help. Um, you know, energy efficiency is is uh, going to be one of the ways really to try and uh, address bills. We've looked bills to come down just because the suppliers, you know, are uh, are going to reduce them again. Uh, we live in hope. Um, but really the other way looking at it is, you know, how do you make the, the house more efficient? And, you know, there are schemes out there what can help people, you know, with insulation, like I say, improving their, their boiler efficiency, um, 
help them with um, one-off payments for, for affordable warmth emergencies. Um, so the same sort of things we're, we're seeing and we're trying to tease out, Richard, you know, um, optimizing the benefit and the, the people's, you know, uh, finances is one of them, but making sure that every other sort of uh, support that's out there is also being utilized. You made a point earlier, Veronica, about pride um, here. That seems to be quite a tricky thing with 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 um, uh, fuel poverty, food poverty. It's a question of how we encourage people to uh, uh, make the call and 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 swallow that pride. It's very difficult because it requires some form of coaching, and you need a lot of time for that, which we generally don't have. But I mean, I have instances of somebody who is struggling and would really benefit from using equity release and she won't because she wants to leave her flat to her children. But she is one of those who is watching the pennies and not eating the fresh food anymore. And um, there is a question that's popped up about, um, I'm sorry to take this off you, Richard, but it's a question that's popped up. Is there um, pressure on people to, create a mortgage to provide money for their children which is generally some form of equity release and yes we do see that and we have the issues then with how do we protect vulnerable clients against those rational people who actually do want to help their children it's a difficult balancing act but it's not the I'm struggling to eat balancing act which is the real real problem. I think there's a knock-on effect Danny isn't there between um, when, when with a cost of living crisis, which is affecting every, uh, all generations, um, sometimes the, the older person is seen as uh, the solution that will we'll take our inheritance early. Yeah, definitely. Um, as mentioned before, we definitely see, um, uh, and mentioned on the helpline, where, where older victim survivors or concerned others, um, other family members who are worried about um, sons and daughters or, or grandsons or, or others sort of coercing um, coercing their, their older relatives to provide the inheritance that they, they feel that they deserve um, before um, the older relative has passed away. Um, this is, uh, in very many cases, a, a sense of psychological abuse, um, as well as uh, being broader part of economic abuse. Um, when you are, uh, are coercing or, or or lying to an older relative around what you want these for, or sort of, as we see, small payments, um, which are, are generally seen um, by many as sort of, oh, that's okay, I'll only give sort of a hundred pounds this week, but it, it, it adds up sort of week on week, day on day. And, and, and the coercion that um, we see, um, because obviously many are struggling across all generations. It's, as we've been talking about sort of poverty as, um, or risk factor for abuse it's a means that sort of when when others don't have the means um or, or struggling with food with heating with transport costs um and the older person may be seen as vulnerable as we as we know sort of um many see an older person as the ideal victim because they're vulnerable they may seem to be weaker um uh, they may ha not have as much mental capacity uh so sort of it's it's seen as an easy target for many um a, an older victim is um i mean yeah we do we do see this we, we see this a lot um and we're seeing it with housing as well um and houses that sort of um giving away a house coercion of a house um i mean we, we all know sort of the how hard it is for younger generations to get on the housing ladder and that is sort of leaking into unfortunately um seemingly um abuse um where sort of the coercion of a house um and then sort of put put my elderly mum or dad into a home or, or, or somewhere else because i need the house now and i need the because of the cost of living so it's sort of a um it's sort of a cycle really um unfortunately and, and marion barton has asked there have speakers been aware of older people having members of their extended family move in with them and not paying towards the cost of living i mean this is i think financial abuse or economic abuse probably makes up about 60%, maybe slightly higher of what we have on a day-to-day -day basis at Hourglass. And that's very much the kind of story we hear a lot. And that's actually the notion of 
younger people moving back in with older people happened a great deal more during the pandemic as well. There was that pressure cooker environment. Um, can we move on to money management? Uh, we talked about solutions earlier. Um, obviously, this is in, in your sweet spot, Veronica and Gary as well. Are we, let's start with Veronica, are there money management tools out there that can help um, older people through this crisis? There are masses of tracking tools to help you work out where you spend your money, but they don't necessarily help you manage it because once you've got to the point where you don't have enough, you're not going out to buy a coffee, you are very much wondering if you can actually boil the kettle at home to make one. Um, there are various bank apps which will help you track, but most older people don't like using them. I think that's a very uh, generic phrase. Um, so there is a lot of help, but you have to be disciplined to use it. And again, if you are at the point where you don't have enough, you probably are disciplined. Having said that, you sometimes watch the programs on television where it's eat well for less and you see these people who say they have no money and are spending a fortune on rubbish. Um, but then you have to be able to understand you could do better if you were more careful. So there are tools on the government website. Um, if you did an internet search on money management or spreadsheets, loads of things would come up. You have to be disciplined to use them and to be able to know if you can buy in bulk and save money, you have to have the money to buy in bulk. So it, it's a bit of a catch 22. Gary, money management. It's not something Make the Call itself would, would address, Richard. Um, the department does fund uh, a separate uh, debt counselling um, provision through independent uh, advice sectors. Um, but what I think we're finding is there's there's that gap between um, maybe make the call, helping you get what you're entitled to, uh, making sure you're getting all the money. But there's a gap between that and somebody actually thinking, I need debt counselling, where it's almost too late. You know, and there's that bit in between where it's budgetary or uh, making the, your money go further. Um, yeah, and I agree with Veronica, you know, we do refer to uh, some online tools, the Money and Pets and Service have got some quite good uh, uh, support sort of uh, tools on their website and again, some good signposting. But I think there, there could be that gap that it's only when somebody is actually thinking, no, now I'm in debt, that they're going to get help. Um, and, you know, it's trying to prevent people getting to that stage. Um, but it's not something our guys would be um, uh, trained in, you know, bar the sort of the common sense part of it that you can sort of say. But, no, I think there is a there is probably a need there. Morgan, from an independent age perspective, is, are there tools out there? Yeah, so we've got a page which I can share in the chat um, supporting people to manage their energy bills, help with water costs, how they might pay for their TV license. And of course there are things people can do, you know, like if you turn your thermostat down by one degree, it can save a huge amount of money. Um, I guess the thing that I'm conscious of is for many of the people we support, they are already doing all of this. And the facts are they just do not have enough money. Um, so I'm always a bit hesitant to say, oh, they could just, I don't know, switch the lights off because the next thing you know, they're doing all the things that we know in terms of cutting back and living lives where they're going to bed at 4 p.m. just to stay warm. So I think there's a level of personal responsibility, of course, with everything, um, but there's definitely things that the government should be doing. One thing to share is Independent Age has a service where we have colleagues who will talk to older people. So let's say they're on a very expensive energy tariff and they will support them to contact the energy company and to tell them what the options are to negotiate a lower tariff. Um, you know, tariffs and discount schemes exist across utility providers, water, phone, energy, broadband. But so many older people have no idea that they exist and they're paying full price. So that is one thing that people can do, contact their supplier, depending on what that service is, and find out if there is anything that they could do in terms of discounting. That's really useful. Um, we're, we are just quickly nudging back to uh, abuse here. Anthony Jackson has made an interesting point. Um, he, he's a bit concerned about the comment around um, older people 
uh, being exploited. He doesn't believe it's totally accurate. He works with struggling families on a daily basis and families help each other. It's not always the abuse of an elderly person. It's often from the love and care motivated. Um, but from his experience, families, members living with older people can help with care and household tasks plus the company received. Um, well, I can probably go in on that a little bit. I mean, that's uh, the entire reason our charity exists, Anthony. Uh, we support older people who are uh, suffering some form of abuse and neglect. And I'm sad to say uh, that, that, uh, that abu those abuse levels are rising. Uh, I joined this organization at the end of 2018 and we were getting around 4,000 impacts or calls per year. And the last year we were uh, touching 30,000. Um, so whilst I think you're right that the vast majority of people are absolutely um, have the best interests of, of their older relatives and friends uh, at heart, um, that there is uh, so much pressure out there, which is leading to some horrible cases. Um, and I think um, it, it's, it's worth saying that, um, that our information team and our casework team are hearing more and more cases of financial abuse in that manner. Um, Danny, have I, have I missed anything there? No, and um, thanks for the comment, Anthony. Um, and we're not saying at all that um, even the vast majority of family members abuse um, abuse their parents or their elderly relatives. But unfortunately, as Richard just said, um, it is it is a growing trend and it is understudied and under research. So unfortunately, we're still working with prevalence data um, from 2017 or 2007. Um, there's no real idea currently uh, as to the, the exact number of older people who see abuse, but we have some ideas and it is, as Richard said, growing, but we're not sort of, of course, where there are, are tons of family members who, uh, millions and millions and millions, the vast, vast majority of family members treat their elderly relatives um, with care, with love and respect. And we're not, we're not trying to sort of tar um, the vast majority, but we do need to understand that this is a problem. And we need to focus on it um, in order to help alleviate it. Okay, that's really useful, Danny. Sorry, I went on, off on a little sidetrack there due to that question. Uh, I wanted to ask about the triple lock. Somebody mentioned it. Actually, it may have been you, Danny. Um, the, the government support, we, we as a charity, I know, are pushing hard for the government support uh, for the, the pension triple lock to be continued. Um, but is there, a, is there an argument also um, to look at a fairer means tested uh, pension benefits approach. Is that something that, um, uh, that, that that we should be championing across the board? Does anyone want to pick up on on, on triple lock and, and means I, tested benefits? I think we should because there are a number of pensioners who do not rely on the state pension and a number who don't need the triple lock but we won't put in a means-tested benefit in the country because it will be political suicide. Do you want to enlarge upon that? <laughs> um, means-tested benefits are not popular because they require people to say, I don't have enough or I haven't managed to get enough. And we I go back to the stigma, which is what I see in, with my clients. Um, but it does seem daft when we have a country which is under-resourced and we are giving an extra payment to people who really don't need it. The trouble is that it's, you've gone and got the national insurance criteria of I've paid into this all my life, I'm entitled to it. It's a very difficult education piece. Uh, personally, I think it should be means tested. That okay. doesn't mean... Interesting opinion. Uh, Gary, anything on that? I have to take the fifth on it, Richard. <laughs> As a, <laughs> um, yeah, not, not on the policy side of the house either, which where would sit I'm more operational, but no, I, I wouldn't have any comment on uh, Morgan. Yeah, so as I said earlier, we support the triple lock at the moment because 20% of people only have the state pension and benefits. So they need to make sure that that is rising with inflation. Um, and particularly last year when there was that was called into question that the government didn't confirm they were going to up, up take better, increase benefits by 
um, inflation, older people were incredibly worried about how they were going to afford their food because all they had was their pension credit and their state pension. Um, so we worked really hard to make sure that pension credit and benefits across working age were all uprated like, alongside lots of other charities. Um, in terms of, well, I mean, independent age, basically, we think there should be a big review into what is an adequate income in later life and what part of that is provided through the state pension and it doesn't necessarily mean all of it will be but but you know part of it will be provided by the state pension which as veronica said many people it's an entitlement and they see it incredibly differently to a benefit um and then separately it needs to work out what is that minimum income in later life and adequate income and how much is the state pension and then how much would be benefit from, from the social security system. So we want to work out like how that could then be topped up because then you could be focusing on the people at more risk and who do need means tested support and don't have savings and things like that. So we think there's a job for, I mean, we're thinking the next government and um, whoever comes into power should do that and make sure that they're working and looking at things like the minimum income standard and things like that JRF have done um, just to try and work out what is needed in later life. Because we hear, we hear a lot from people who get the state pension just miss out on pension credit and are telling us they are really struggling and obviously that's getting worse and worse with the cost of living crisis so there needs to be a look at what is enough to live on in later life if you don't have private pensions and savings it surprises me that that, that doesn't exist um you know that we don't understand uh, more about um you know the how where where pensioners exist within that that poverty crisis the cost of living crisis so that's an interesting point yeah i think i mean what we experience and i'm sure others on the call might have the same is we get a lot of pushback around all older people being rich wealthy mortgage free <laughs> lots of savings it's almost like the 2 million pensioners in poverty do not exist um so when you're thinking about things like um the state pension i mean that wouldn't cover rent in london the weekly state pension would not cover your rent let alone anything else so there's assumptions made about what people need at that time in life which aren't accurate for lots of people and um, you know private renters in later life is growing and growing and we're doing some new research on that that we'll hopefully have ready in the next few months um, but they're a group we're really really worried about they're at massive risk very vulnerable to financial abuse and to lots of other things can I ask about uh, the patchwork of different sort of uh, pathways towards support? Do organisations, for example, from, from your perspective, Gary, do are, are people who ring into you aware of things uh, like charities who are in the sector? Is that part of your advice? Um, or and, and have people already attacked that route before they come to you? It can vary, Richard. Um, we, we try and... Uh gather information of how did you hear about our service you know and we've got all these different categories and you come up against brick wall because 90 percent say word of mouth so they don't know who ever told them they don't know where they heard it so, so we're always trying to find out what's the best way to reach out to people um i think what can happen um across the voluntary and community sector um and just speaking from a northern ireland perspective um sometimes there can be uh almost too many options um, and people don't know which one's relevant to them. It can be a wee bit of competition, you know, um, go to these people, they're better than them people. Nice. And also it can be the, the rural urban thing. Um, we have quite a lot of uh, support organisations in the larger towns and cities, but you tend to find them when you go out into the rural communities, there's less out there. Um, so there is uh, I would agree when you say it's patchy. You know, if if you're sitting as an older person, think where do I go to get help? Where's my first stop? You know, there's a plethora of people to approach, but what's one's the right one? You you, you don't know. Is and picking up on that point, Danny, is there a, is there an obvious link for increased levels of uh, of poverty around older people when it comes to social isolation? Um, definitely, uh, there definitely is. Um, unfortunately, again, this is, um, as we see continually, older people are uh, sort of not seen in data sets and a focus, or as we talked just on the, the, the discussion around means testing um, and the, the, the two million odd pensioners in poverty, it's it's seen older people in, in generally, um, in many cases, are just not, not seen 
um, not seen in, in society from a from a data collection standpoint in, in this case, and especially around social isolation. Obviously, there are many links that we see between um, social isolation and poverty, um, with poverty affecting your mental health and mental well-being. Um, it may very well make you not want to leave the house, or if you do have um, social groups or community groups and friends, you may not be able to um, afford to, to visit them, um, but increased transport costs, or you may um, may not be uh, well enough to visit them. You may have suffered from malnutrition because of rising food prices, and you may not want to sort of, again, a pride thing um, for friends and community members that, that may know you um, before sort of you experience the social or economic crisis. Um, and, and a pride thing you don't want, um, and we, we could all understand that sort of if you're really struggling through something, a lot of times you just want to sort of isolate yourself. Um, so, I mean, although sort of the data really needs to sort of focus more on older people, there are generally links between um, poverty and wider social isolation and loneliness. And we've seen that these loneliness and socialization also increase the risk of violence and abuse affecting older people because if those community links or if those friendship groups um, are cut then who do you talk to if you're if someone is violent towards you or abuses you um who do you have to call um if you don't know about or there may not exist a support network next to you then it really increases the risk of abuse um for older people thanks Danny. that's really useful Really useful. Um, Morgan, this is pretty central to, to what to uh, independent ages campaign as well, isn't it? The, the um, people suffering poverty in different ways. Yeah, I mean, everyone's experience is obviously different. Um, but yeah, we definitely see themes and patterns through our helpline and, and the conversations that we have. Um, and as you know, as has been said across the webinar, that there are groups of older people who are more hidden, more invisible, um, and aren't listened to as much, and maybe wouldn't be as likely to step forward for support. So, um, you know, as I said earlier, there are certain groups like 80 plus single women, people from Black and Asian communities, private renters, carers as well, who are often completely overwhelmed by everything else that they're having to deal with. So we want to try and make sure that we're shining a spotlight alongside organisations like Hourglass to make sure that those people know the support that's out there that's available to them, whether they're living in financial hardship or whether they're experiencing worse than that in terms of financial abuse and things. That's all very useful. And and um, I, I, it's, I realize it's not a particularly uh, fascinating subject area, so I won't go into it in too much detail, but how much how much data do we actually have, Danny? Is, is there, do, do we know what we're dealing with? Um, well, as I've mentioned sort of throughout this, and I, I continually mention, um, everyone's bored of me because I, I won't stop going on about how how the lack of data focused on specific groups of older people is really stymieing us to um, create a coherent understanding of um, how abuse and poverty affects older people. Obviously, Morgan and Independent Age are doing some great work, um, especially um, with sort of qualitative case studies and actually um, illuminating the voices of, of older people. But from a, um, from a more sort of hard data statistical um, quantitative sense, um, a lot of the time it's hard to, to get that hard data. And especially with, as Morgan has just said, many groups who are in poverty. I mean, if you're phoning someone, if you're using a phone survey um, in order to get data, these people may not, um, have the money to afford a mobile phone or a landline and that makes total sense i mean are you going to afford to have a landline when you're struggling to pay um your food bills or to feed yourself or your family um they they may not have digital literacy skills or access to um a computer in order to fill in surveys or or hear from researchers and we've seen a number like a dramatic closing of local libraries um sort of over the last 10 or so years um and these means of older people and those in poverty in order to access ways to connect with the outside world. And as I've just mentioned in the last point, um, if you're isolating yourself because of um, you can't afford to feed yourself or you're struggling with, with worries about heating and, uh, and fuel uh, prices, then, I mean, you, you won't want to talk to a researcher or, or something like that. It's, 
as Veronica has continually been going on, and um, Gary and Morgan too, pride yeah. is a huge thing that we continually see um, among um, older people and older victims and survivors. And you don't want to sort of talk about um, when you've, if you if you've become poor or suffering from poverty in older age, and you've you've had a, a life that wasn't in poverty before then. It's very embarrassing. So then you don't want to talk to um, a researcher or someone collecting data. And so it's very hard um, in this way to actually get a coherent and clear insight into the levels of poverty and how poverty affects other people. And we've really got to sort of work out ways in which we can do that. That's really useful, Danny. You mentioned a couple of triggers there. Are there other triggers, Gary, that we've missed from your perspective when people make the call to you? No, it gets, it's, it's a wide variety, Richard. Um, people contact us. It can be a change in, in circumstances. You know, um, we have a good link up with the department's bereavement line. So if somebody is in a, a partnership and one of the partners dies, the bereavement line is a one-stop place to report it. But again, there's good signposting goes on from there. So the person can get referred in to make the call to do a, a benefit needs assessment to see you know what their circumstances are now so there can be things happening or whether it's a, a diagnosis or a change in a health condition that may prompt them to think i need to get some advice um right down to you know whether it's advertising campaigns or again this great word of mouth you know just from talking to somebody else to say you know i know somebody that got it or i know of this organization can can you contact us um I think during cost of living crisis, um, the Department for Communities Known Ireland has been to the fore, um, but there are probably limitations to what they can actually do. You know, they, they can't control prices, but um, promotion of services like ourselves has been one of the important bits. You know, um, one of the things you need to do if you're struggling financially, first and foremost, make sure you're getting all the money you're entitled to. Is the, it, what, what was the the message we're trying to get out there really prompt people to examine their their, uh, their finances. But again, I say there's no one definitive uh, pathway to us that can come partner organizations, um, health trusts, you know, anybody else that, that is, is dealing with people and think that they could benefit from our service, you know, we can get referrals from them as well. That's really useful. Um, Veronica, you, you sort of have two two heads today in terms of, and both are very good friends of uh, Hourglass um, in the respect that Talis are working with us on our given hour scheme, uh, where um, people, uh, uh, Talis are giving an hour of their time um, to support people who are suffering these types of issues. And likewise, um, Solar are one of our, we're charity of the year for the Solar this year, which is fantastic news. Um, from, a, from your perspective, are there, we've mentioned bereavement, are there other triggers that, that will um, uh, encourage people to make the call to your, to yourself as Talis or even from a solar, solar perspective? Well, from a bereavement obviously is, is one of the main triggers because life changes to such an extent um, and income can be affected dramatically as well if you've been relying on a double pension and suddenly you're down to one or one and a half. Uh, the other one, of course, is the need for care and whether or not you can afford to pay for it yourself, uh, which is astronomical, or whether you can actually find a reasonable local authority home, because some of them are definitely not where I would like to have put my mum. Uh, but they are there and you have to have a bed if you need help you've got to have somewhere to sleep so that's the other area where we would get most of our calls um, we don't generally get the sort of calls that hourglass might receive which is the pressurized call i'm being pressurized to get money to my kids that we would find out when chatting to a client and I have sat with clients with the daughters thinking this lady is a vulnerable client. This daughter is pressurizing her. I need to have a private conversation. So. Um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Morgan, you, you mentioned something in the chat there about um, the, the, the bereavement side of things as well. Yeah. Um, bereavement is 
as we all know, is definitely a huge trigger for many people and it can put them into poverty and it can also make them eligible for things like pension credit where they weren't before. So, for example, if you've got a couple and the man dies, it, it can be quite common that the woman might have taken time out of work to care for friends or um, children or family members. It could have been that the woman went part time because of those caring responsibilities. So when they were married, it might have been that they qualified for the full state pension together. But then once the woman is single and bereaved, she does qualify for pension credit. The problem is a lot of people don't realise that when they're in, when the money from their pension drops, they assume it's the drop due to the bereavement, which it is. But they don't know it's gone below what they should be getting as a single person. Um, and they're not told, oh, actually, what you should be getting is this. But you're now getting down here and you might be entitled to something else. So we've been working with DWP to try and make sure that they're making that clearer, that they are saying, you know, you're on a lower state pension and, and you could receive this top up called pension credit. The other thing which I think often gets forgotten about is separation and divorce. Um, also massive triggers similarly to bereavement in terms of your circumstances and your costs. Um, so that's another big trigger where people could suddenly start experiencing financial problems. OK, just going back to the questions here for a second, uh, Gary, um, you've had a bit of a thank you from uh, Margaret McCloskey in mentioning the work of moneyhelper.org.uk. Um, I've, I've not heard of Money Helper. What, what's, what's the background there, Gary? Um, Margaret will probably uh, mess me afterwards and say I got it wrong. Um, I think it's, it's uh, the Money and Pension Service. Um, is funded by DWP and in Northern Ireland also by Department for Communities. And it's the Money Helper Org is their online presence. Um, and there's a lot of useful tools there, um, especially about planning pensions. Um, there's, uh, they can help track down lost pensions, you know, where people have worked somewhere. I'm not sure whether it's, they're still entitled to money from there. Right through to signposts and referencing the agencies, very local to them, who can help out, like I said, with, with, with debt counselling or with uh, 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 maximising income tools as well. That's really useful. Uh, thanks for that. Thanks for that comment as well, Margaret. Um, we are coming into the final furlong of our webinar here. Um, if, if anybody has any questions um, for our group, please put them um, on the chat and, and I'll ask them on, on your behalf. Um, I think it, we are um, in a situation where we don't know what the next um, next crisis is going to be. Um, that's not a political point. Um, with the rate of inflation the way it is, um, and the, the only 3.1 compared to 8% expected inf inflation uh, moving forward with pension credits and so on and so forth, uh, 900,000 older people are not uh, accessing those pension credits. And without being very England focused, we are likely to see a city the size of London uh, of older people uh, between now and 2050. So we're in a situation now where we don't know what the next crisis is going to be. The, 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 the question I want to ask, but I'm not sure anybody has the answer for it, is are we prepared for that? Do we know um, what is required uh, and what services are required to deal with that onslaught of, of issues, no matter what the next government looks like? And does anyone have a, have a take on that? I think we know the answer. We just don't know the solution. The answer is no, we are not prepared for it. No. Did we not learn anything from COVID? Do we ever learn anything from anything? I'm sorry, I'm totally cynical here. Okay, well, I think it's, uh, I think certainly uh, we saw within COVID uh, uh, perhaps a little bit more togetherness than normal. Uh, and, and we in the charity also uh, saw. Uh, there being a mixed bag in terms of volunteers that want to support people out there, but then a trickle of volunteers that ended up uh, committing abuse of older people at the same time because there was there was that open door. Uh, so I, I think we have um, we we have a lot of lessons to learn from that perspective, um, and not the lack of data as Danny has uh, mentioned a number of times is causing us a real issue in not just from a third sector, but from a public sector perspective, understanding what services are required and how we can rebuild them. But I think campaigns like your own one, Morgan, will make a real difference there because innovation perhaps is the way forward here um, and, and, and collaboration. Um, but we as a charity have supported um, 
I think it was uh, yourselves, Independent Age, and I think Age Scotland have got a bit of a campaign out there about a commissioner for older people in England. Um, uh, and there is no longer an, a minister for older people in Scotland, uh, which is a bit of an odd one. Um, and um, and I know that you don't have a, an assembly at all at functioning at the moment in Northern Ireland, but you do have a commissioner for older people uh, over there. So I suppose those campaigns will also help in sort of underlining what's required, Morgan, from that perspective. Yeah, so Independent Age has been working with Hourglass um, and others across sort of the ageing space, but also cross sector and cross age, because I think everybody realises that we all hope to get to later life and we all want to have a secure and happy and healthy and, you know, positive time when we get there. So we had in England over 80 organisations supported a statement. Many of the organisations had been campaigning in their own right, like Hourglass, and others had not thought about this before, but thought it was something good to support and were positive about it. So we had 80 organisations support in England um, and we had over 30 in Scotland. Um, and as Richard said, there are already older people's commissioners in Wales and Northern Ireland. The purpose for us would be government departments do not seem to work together, particularly in Westminster at the moment. And they they sort of, you know, they, they'll deal with something that's quite niche or, or related to their department, but they won't think more broadly about the impacts on older people. And in Wales and Northern Ireland, the commissioner's role is to bring those voices together, um, to raise up the problems that they're hearing, to deliberately focus on groups that might be less heard, um, and also to help coordinate and facilitate government departments. And commissioners can have a really big impact. There are commissioners in Hourglass who know a lot more about this than me, but there are already commissioners on domestic abuse, there's a children's commissioner um, and it's meant to be a role that is given power that does have the power to make change and to call people to task and to understand more from government departments about what's happening so um, independent age and lots of others are continuing to like push this together across the nations hoping that we can get one introduced in both Scotland and England. I think um, there is a real issue here in the respect that we need champions for older people across all four nations um, and uh, with there not being a commissioner for older people and with the domestic abuse commissioner in England and Wales not so focused on older people uh, and we're missing a victims commissioner at the moment in England and Wales. Um, that's, I believe, something which is recruitment is ongoing. Uh, there is a, a, a new victims commissioner in Northern Ireland that's just started in, in, in recent months. Um, how involved they will be in this type of work, because clearly there is a strong link between the financial abuse of older people and, and the victim mentality. Um, but I do know that the Welsh um, Older People's Commissioner had a, uh, a key theme of economic abuse. I think it was the year before last. So I think there is probably a need to review the effectiveness of the commissioners in Northern Ireland and Wales to look at what those roles are and how independent, uh, I don't mean in day-to-day uh, -day independence, but how independent their decision-making is to, to prompt change at government level. Uh, and it would be, um, uh, the, the uh, as, as somebody has just said on the chat, the Scottish Older People's Minister, which was Christine McKelvey, who was actually very supportive, has, was not reappointed. So there is a real lack of government across all four nations, I believe, focus on the plight of older people at this moment in time. And uh, we made the point to the Domestic Abuse Commissioner last week in Parliament that we need her support in making the voices of older people at risk um, louder. Um, so yes, it's, 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 uh, we did support your campaign uh, at Independent Age. It's something we've been working on ourselves for three or four years. Uh, but how we review that is is really important to us as well. Um, is there anything I've missed from your campaign perspective? Because I think it's a really important one, Morgan. No, I don't think so. I've just popped um, something in the chat because we obviously it's fantastic that we've been able to 
showcase like the number of organizations that are supporting this but individuals can also take action to show their support so i've just um shared a link and if you think this is a good idea and you think the voices of older people from across the board should be better represented and that a commissioner could help do that you can it take, literally takes two minutes just to add your name to a statement we've had nearly two and a half thousand people do that so far and we've got one for england slash westminster and one for scotland um so i've just popped that in there for anyone that's interested Yep, I think that's really useful. We have had a question. Actually, I'm not sure whether we have a great deal of specialism around this, Anthony, but thank you for the question. Now, there's a growing trend to move relatives abroad to Thailand or other overseas countries for cheaper care. This has raised ethical and safeguarding issues. It's also due to spiraling costs of care for residential and nursing care homes. Uh, I wonder if this, this trend has been noticed. I'm not sure this is something that the hourglass, Danny, would have a particular view on. Does anyone else have a have a, uh, an opinion on this? No, I, I don't think so. I think um, decision making is something that we can comment on. Um, certainly, we at Hourglass are um, been campaigning for many years around the lasting power of attorney uh, and, and people's decision making processes um, and deputy ships and so on, which is all has slightly different interpretations across the four nations. Um, so I think when uh, poverty hits, um, I think there is a uh, 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 decision making comes into question then, I guess. Um, that's that's the lasting power of attorney would be one uh, would be one question, one decision that you'd need to make as a as a family, I guess. Um, that's something you must deal with, Veronica, the LPAs. Yes. And making sure that when they are actually actioned, that the money is being spent appropriately. Well, we do come across cases where the attorney thinks that it is OK to spend this money and buy myself a car because I will occasionally take mum out. No, it's not. Um, so it is choosing your attorney is a real matter of trust and you never know what's going to happen in the future. But it's more important you have it than you don't have it. Because if you don't have the power of attorney in place and you lose capacity, then your finances are locked up and that can be a real problem for looking after yourself. Um, Danny, we've had campaigns about LPAs for some time. Um, what's what where 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 are we currently? There's there's currently some government moves on reviewing this, isn't there? Uh we have, but if I can just move back to Anthony's question slightly. Of course. Yes, yeah, sorry. I think part of the problem is uh obviously the lack of the two major parties in either wanting to deal with social care. Um, social care is seen as the black sheep uh, in the health and social care family. Um, while obviously um, better funding uh, and uh, in some respects reform for the NHS is desperately needed, social care is consistently forgotten about and pushed away. We've been promised a white paper on social care for the last however many years, um, Anthony, and honestly, both main parties um, have chucked on the bus. It'll be very interesting to see with the election next year if uh, either parties put a strong focus on social care in their manifesto, but it is sorely needed. Um, and obviously the, the, the CQC every year, which is the regulatory body for care homes and nursing homes and, and some hospitals, um, brings out a state of care and continually year on year we are seeing a trend of um, rising costs, um, lower work, um, employment in, in social care and, and it, it's no it's not a surprise that you're, we're seeing a, a growing issue of um, older people uh, heading abroad um, in order to get cheaper care. Um, it makes sense and we really need to take a good look uh, from a political and policy standpoint on the future for social care and really raise it on an equal level um, with uh, health. Sorry, that was... Uh... No, not at all. And and we should also point out that it's not just a Westminster issue. Um, no, sorry, that's my uh, England... Uh... No, no, not sorry. at all. <laughs> it's worth remembering that um, the government in Scotland is still very keen, I believe, to have a national care service um, in Scotland. Uh, they haven't yet explained how that will be funded or what the process is. But I do know that they're very keen um, to have a 
uh, a social care focused service uh, in Scotland. Um, uh, and, I, and I likewise believe that um, the last health minister, Robin Swan in, in Northern Ireland, likewise was, was looking to, um, to look at uh, prioritizing social care. So, I, and it, it will become a big issue across all four nations within the UK. I think in uh, in in coming elections. Um, uh, okay, um, we have some comments coming up here. Um, so, uh, Kat completely agrees with you around the, the, your your last comments, Danny, around uh, social care. Um, uh, Anthony, who asked the questions about uh, uh, people moving their families to uh, Thailand. Uh, says he regularly promotes LPAs and deputy ships, which I think is really, really good to hear. And uh, you have a request for contact, uh, Veronica, from uh, one of, and I think uh, Naeem can probably pass that on to you uh, directly. Uh, we have 10 minutes left. Now, I I wanted to, to, to sort of uh, do two things. One would be to talk about the next webinar, but also to mention a bit more about uh, the uniqueness of Gary's service. Um, I think I've just given you ownership of that service, Gary, but um, it, it's such a unique service that you have there. So could you, do you think you could give us a couple of minutes in explaining a bit more about what you do? Um, because I think this seems like something we should be having in, in every nation, in uh, uh, every, every, every one of the nations that we as a charity support. Yeah, certainly. Um, the, what we now call Make the Call Wraparound Service, it's historically about 20 years old and it initially started um, in line with when pension credit was first rolled out to promote the uptake of pension credit. Um, over the years, it's developed to cover all benefits which is administered by the by the department, which are all your welfare benefits, um, disability, health related benefits uh, and pensions as well. Um, so there's two elements to the to the service. We have a headquarters in uh, in Belfast that our helpline team use, and we've roughly about 20 people manning phones nine to five Monday to Friday um, on working days. Um, our second element of that is the community outreach service, um, and that's about 32 uh, officers spread across Northern Ireland, aligned roughly with their jobs and benefits offices. Um, where they can base themselves if need be as well, but it gives them a good spread across the, across the country. Um, an important thing is anybody ringing through to our helpline, we'll do a benefit needs assessment. So it'll be going through somebody's circumstances, looking at the, the, the benefits they're already receiving, trying to identify if there's anything else they could be entitled to, discussing their, their health, their family's health as well, and seeing what else could be identified. Um, if something is identified and uh, the person feels it could help, if uh, they had assistance completing the form and it would help face to face, the telephony team will refer to one of the outreach officers who can go out and do a local visit, meet the person, go through the form, make sure everything's covered off. But then we also look at beyond the benefits, what other services could, could help, what other organisations do we know of that could also assist somebody? So we do a lot of work with um, disabled parking, the blue badge scheme, popularly known as. We can help fill forms in for that, help people understand, you know, what the the criteria is for it and what would help them there. Um, talked about the affordable warmth. We'd also link into as well if people are needing help with healthcare costs. We can help complete them forms and understand again how they use them and when they use them. And again, with any sort of uh, travel schemes, if they need to apply for that, we can also help. So it's trying to do that uh, service, which isn't just, um, here's the, the benefits, here's the money, we're away again. Um, I said, sort of touched on before, we, we work with a lot of partnerships um, across other government departments and also voluntary and community sector. And they're very important in uh, referring into our sales, but also being somewhere else, we can refer somebody for that, that support that they could need as well. And how would somebody access this? Is this a, a do you have a, a, a phone line that people ring in on? Yeah, we're an 0800 number. Um, I'll, I'll put a link into the, the, the chat um, afterwards. Um, we're an 0800 number, or people can uh, text us and we will call them back, or people can use the, the NI Direct, which is the equivalent of Gov UK, to, to come in and contact us as well. We're on there. Um, 
So I'm saying we do usually three advertising campaigns throughout the year, local TV, radio, um, local newspapers with with testimonials as well. You know, it's find that very good. Somebody in the area, you know, somebody lived in Lisburn area in Northern Ireland. They contacted me at the call. They found out they were entitled to some pension credit. They are now so much a week better off and are able to access. That's a very uh, a very good uh, way of getting people to think, well, that sounds like my circumstances. I'm in this area. I might try it as well. Um, that's really we do it. Yeah. That's really useful. Um, how do people get, in, get hold of um, Independent Age, Morgan? Sorry, just unmuting. Um, so we can be called on a free helpline. Um, the number is... 0800 319 6789 and that's for individuals who might need our support but also professionals if you want to get guides or anything like that we've also got a website with all of our information which i've shared in the chat um, and we have advisors if there's something a bit more technical that people want to talk through um, a problem they might need help with or applying for a benefit or something like that so free helpline online information and also paper-based guides that we can send out if you call the helpline uh, Veronica, how do people get in touch with Talis or um, your role from a solar, pers a solar perspective as well? So the Talis main office number is 01233722999. And that will put you through to any one of the advisors if you have a generic question. If you want to contact me direct, it's 0208581 Or there are two websites, there's talisifa.com and london-ifa.co.uk. So if you do a search, you will find us. Danny, the, our details in the Knowledge Bank, um, how can people get hold of Hourglass? Yeah, so um, uh, we have a 24-hour uh, helpline. Uh, the number of that is uh, 0808 808 8141. We also have a free tech service, um, and the number of that is 078 6005 2906. Um, our, our, our website is org, and on the website you can talk to um, an information officer via the website. Uh, you can uh, read our uh, blogs, you can uh, look at policy and research documents, or you can go to our knowledge bank, which is linked through that website. Um, which contains a number of documents and reports um, of various subjects related to the abuse of old people and safer aging. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Danny. Um, I wanted to thank everybody who has taken part in the webinar today. Um, I've actually learned an awful lot. Um, and the services out there that's, that are playing such a role in helping is fantastic. Uh, I am slightly concerned about what the future holds um, and how we can continue to upskill um, and uh, create data for across the four nations. But it's uh, been a really uh, inspirational chat today. So thank you to everybody. Um, I'm going to leave um, the webinar with a little bit of a, a call out for our next webinar, which is on the 15th of June, which is the World Elder Abuse Day. Um, sorry, World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. I should know that off by heart, really, shouldn't I? Uh, being the only uh, Elder Abuse UK charity. Um, and um, if you want to keep up to date with our webinars, then please keep an eye on the um, the, the We Are Our Glass uh, socials and website. This, um, this webinar will be up on the Knowledge Bank in the next couple of days, uh, but this necessarily isn't the end of this conversation. If there are other points you want to, uh, want to raise, uh, then please come back to us if we can help, uh, all four of us, of course. Um, and um, I think the best thing to do in these situations is where like-minded people can work together, we can make more of a difference. Um, so on that note, uh, and probably about 30 seconds early, so I'm sorry about that, my timekeeping was too good. Um, I'd like to thank everybody. Uh, thanks to everybody attending the, the webinar and to our panellists, and uh, we'll speak to everyone soon. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks.